enthusiasts and the people who love them. Hello, my friends. This is Mickey Desai, your host and producer of The Thing About Cars. I've got a very exciting announcement for you. You may remember that special conversation we had with Warren Jobs. He's the CEO of Sealskin Covers. Well, guess what? We're going to actually give away a sealskin cover to one lucky listener of The Thing About Cars. At the end of this episode, I'll tell you how to enter to win the sealskin cover. In the meantime, I hope you enjoy this episode of The Thing About Cars. Hello, welcome back. This is The Thing About Cars. Around the table, we've got our usual conspirators, a full table of conspirators this time. Becca. Ronnie. Ben. And I'm Mickey. We have two special guests today. Kinder. And John. John, uh, we we talked with Kinder about her experiences getting into the industry. Please tell us about your experiences and what you do in the industry. But first, some trivia. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ronnie. That, that was a very good movie found voice too. Yeah, yes. Before I completely get off track here, so our trivia, our grand trivia auto moment of the day. Uh, the question is: Premier Automotive Group was formed in the early two thousands, primarily to handle Ford's acquisition of European brands such as Aston Martin, Land Rover, Jaguar, and Volvo. Which two American brands were also rolled into this premier automotive group umbrella, right? Was it Mercury and Plymouth, Mercury and Lincoln, Lincoln and Hummer, or Pontiac and Oldsmobile? Seems like a pretty straightforward answer to me. But mm -hmm. uh, let's think about it for a minute. I see a couple couple puzzled faces around the table. So let's just jump into our agenda again. Where I'm we left so off. I'm so bad at this. I'm so <laughs> bad at well, this. What's really funny, the reason why I'm kind of banging my head, a previous employer that was actually a customer. I'm like, oh, I should know this. And <laughs> right. Anyway. Let, let's give John a spotlight here. Let's say, uh, John, what do you got? Cool. Hi. So, yeah, I'm John. Um, my experience of being with cars and having a love affair with this like passion uh starts from when i was a kid but um i started kind of similar to your previous guest kinder i started with autocross first went to road racing then went to uh just now i am a professional stunt driver and stuntman in the uh film industry road racing led to stunt driving yes i used to race professionally for volkswagen back oh. in, yeah back in 2008 yeah that sounds like it must have been fun very fun <laughs> Uh, I wish I was still doing it, but as you know, uh, racing is very expensive. So how and why? I mean, are you following in Kinder's footsteps, and did you wipe out and wreck <laughs> first? Or? Uh, you know, this is, it's just one of those things where, uh, yes, I did wipe out and wreck. <laughs> <laughs> that did, definitely did happen. But kind of similar to how she started, I bought, my, I bought a B, uh, 95 BMW M3 when I was 18. Very stupid uh, choice, but I was dumb and had some money. And uh, I didn't know how to drive manual. I learned how to drive a manual through that car. I learned how to try to drift on that car. I learned to crash a lot and I learned a lot of mistakes, but it also taught me a lot of lessons because that is a driver's car. But from there, went on to just be, you know, wanting to get into it more. I wanted to make a career out of motorsport. I wanted to be a race car driver full time and I wanted to have a paid salary from it. And, um, I've, you know, I've always, I've always loved cars since I was a kid. And so that was the kind of path I wanted to go, but you know, didn't really work out that way, but I'm now kind of still doing something I'm passionate about, which is stunt driving. Actually, I would say, long story short, I would say autocross actually is, now that I'm looking back at it, autocross was my foundation, and that is actually probably one of the best tools I've ever had for in terms of making me a better stunt driver, in terms of being precision and all that kind of stuff like that. Your entry into autocross with the BMW or with a different car? Yeah, BMW. Did you have to do any special outfitting, any special equipping? As to... uh, I would, you know, I would just tinker some mods here and there, just like intake, random crap that, you know, you bolt-ons that every, every kid wants to put on their car to sound, make it sound cooler, louder, meaner, whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. but no, like, uh, I just came out there and with my M3 and, you know, it's like definitely more car than my actual talent. But because, like, it was such a great car, I would just go out there and I won, like, my novice class the first time, my first autocross. But, you know, it, this wasn't an overly competitive field like Atlanta. This is a small town in Mississippi, so, you know, apples are oranges. It should also be said that M-class cars from BMW are production race cars. Like, you really don't need to do anything, despite, you know, John saying adding an intake and bolting on a muffler oh, yeah. or whatever else. You really don't need to do If you have a BMW, <laughs> period. You really don't need to do anything except for, except for making sure it's not leaking fluids, which they do quite frequently. Uh, yes, I seem to re first. remember you referring to many different BMWs as being turds. Yes. <laughs> yeah. that, that's what I've heard Ronnie <laughs> refer to them as well. Yeah. 
And to be fair, it's mainly because of the cost of maintenance, and I think that's an illusion that a lot of people need to kind of deal with. Like, you can get a 2008 BMW 750iL for about $14,000, but brand new, that vehicle was somewhere around $97,000. And so your maintenance bill is of that of a $97,000 car, Yeah. but if you bought it for, you know, $15,000, you're disillusioned as far as what sure. you might be paying to repair it. it- Sorry, I, and I will add on to that. I mean, absolutely, what Ronnie's saying. Like, I think what more people are used to are maybe like Japanese imports, where they're so reliable, you barely do anything. You do your old changes, you do simple maintenance, and they'll last forever. Right. Whereas with German cars, stereotypically, you have to put a lot of money to prevent a maintenance, and so that's um, you know that's kind yeah. of an issue. Kimber's nodding. Is this is this true? I mean, yeah, it's definitely true because I went from a Miata to a um a GTI. Oh. So Japanese to German, and my car already had issues within the first month I got it. <laughs> yeah, the tachometer broke, and it just hangs. <laughs> we were laughing over people starting their stories with wrecking, mm. but it, it's a lot like learning to walk. You fall down. So we all, anybody who's done, I don't know, any kind of racing or even just messed around in their car probably has plenty of accident collision stories it's one of those things where learn. i would think that you have to learn by making some mistakes yeah you, you press your yeah. limits you find out what's too far what yeah. what you can do so okay so yeah. forgive me these, these yeah. my stupid question here is that that why would you choose to do arriving uh, any kind of driving for a living instead of i don't know any kind of office job or something like that no i mean not a stupid job at, not, mm. not a stupid question at all my dad was probably asking the same thing <laughs> <laughs> because office jobs suck oh, yeah. i mean you know my dad is one who was like wants reliability and wants like you know me to have he wanted me to have like a consistent kind of like safe secure thing right so for him it was like a crazy notion that i wanted to like race cars and do dangerous stuff like that like why would you want to do that but and i guess it's just something that i was passionate about and i really loved and i was very interested in and um i couldn't see myself being stuck in a like you know it's there's people who i'm sure any of us will meet at the track or any like car people whatever they will live for the uh what, what is that saying it's like they they work for the weekends but you know so instead mm. i i didn't want to live that life i didn't want to like you know be stuck in a cubicle and work 40 hours a week or more just to try to slave away to live my hobby on the weekend i'd rather like do that full time i think that's sound logic when that probably sure, freaks yeah. out every parent in right. the world right yeah. and so. very few are fortunate to be able to yep. you need know, to realize that so that's you know i would be proud I'm a parent. I think yeah. I would be proud. It's, unless they said motorcycle. <laughs> then I, I've known too many people who have had severe, sometimes fatal accidents. So, so but if it was a car, I'd be proud. Oh, yeah. I haven't even told my parents about my motorcycle accidents. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you get all your limbs. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, luckily. Uh, on the other side, I'm going to defend my, my parents and all our parents here for a minute. Because on the one hand, wanting that stability for your child, I think, is just the natural thing for any parent sure. to want. You know, you, you want to make sure they can make a living and that they can have benefits and so on and so forth. On the other hand, it took me, I don't know, how many decades to figure out that I stopped wanting to live for the weekends. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to live my hobby, right? I wanted to turn right. my hobbies into a thing. And so that's why we need all of our listeners to go to Patreon and so we can uh, pay rent and get ramen. <laughs> Pizza for the gang and so on and so forth. But, See, uh, I would just want my kids to enjoy life. Right. You know, I, yeah. I've done the whole working in cubicles, and they're always gray. Mm. They're, oh they're never gosh. even happy colors. They're yeah. dismal. A, we're completely off cars now, but cubicles are, I think, an affront to anything relating to civilized living. Um, yeah. Right. No, you know, just go they're out, so enjoy dehumanizing. Life. Yeah. They, cubi they call them a cubicle farm for a reason. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and ramen noodles are good. So as long as they've got a roof over their head and, you know, right, some right. ramen noodles, then. Right. Happy so, life. Mm -hmm. John, what's your daily yeah. driver? Uh, daily driver right now is a very boring 2002 Toyota Highlander, but it does its job, and um, I get more of my passion now from my motorcycles. That's my need for – that kind of satisfies my need for speed. Your adrenaline things. thing. Yes. yes got yeah, it. absolutely. We didn't ask you this question. What's your daily driver? That's a 2012 Volkswagen GTI. And that's not what you race? I did, actually, a month ago, hmm. but I sold my Miata two months ago. Okay. 
Yeah, and that, I think that's the beauty about autocross in general. You can race it on the weekends and you know still be able to drive it throughout the week because oh, yeah. the wear and tear is mainly on the tires, not so much the car as a whole. Mm. And tires are replaceable. Right, much more <laughs> Thank replaceable. Goodness. And, you know, you could get that done at Costco or Discount Tire or Kaufman Tire. Free adverts for all you guys, by the way. Adverts for everyone. Uh, so, Kinder, Kinder, you're not an adrenaline junkie, or are you? I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she says calmly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel calm now because you guys are all like, we're all sitting down and all that. But um. But you're not yeah. into motorcycles. You're not into. I was before, oh. but um, my dad, he, he actually got hit by a bus when he was on a motorcycle. Holy He's geez. still alive. <laughs> but um, And I had an ex that was hit on a motorcycle. Um, so, yeah, I just know too many people that have been hurt. Exactly. Oh, it's a it's a bad omen. I would I would not recommend it for anyone. And I say this as I ride for several years now. It's like, uh, I'm kind of like I've gotten to several accidents lately. I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know. Like <laughs> I'm kind of like thinking about maybe I should scale back. Yeah. Like, yeah. is it really worth it? Of course, we have a person at this table who's an avid avid motorcyclist and uh, is seriously into the field and and I think takes major efforts to do it responsibly. Wouldn't you say that, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm extremely conscientious about it. It's not an adrenaline thing at all. Oh. Uh, I think, you know, a lot of the riders out there, if, if they could get an F-16 for comparable money, they'd be doing that instead. They're not on it for the love of two wheels. They're just on for the rush. You know, uh, I'm on for the love of being on two wheels. I love that. It's playing with physics, you know, whenever you're maneuvering on it. And uh, I, I wear all my gear. I take my safety courses. Uh, I do all that stuff. And I've ridden from here to Canada and back. Huh. Well, yeah, I remember you talking about your trips. Yeah. We still want to put but together a... it's all a, what you make it individually. You sure, know. sure. Yeah. We still need to put together a, a motorcycle panel for this show, but you know, Becca. Have you seen the jacket that you wear when you're riding a motorcycle and if you're in an accident, it inflates like an airbag? There are a couple different ones yeah. out there. Yeah, and there's the best, too. <laughs> they're kind of interesting. Uh, I don't know if it's really worth the money or not, but they, it's kind of an interesting idea. It makes those of us at home feel better, at least. <laughs> Somebody True. had, many years ago, I saw this thing on the internet about a, a collar, like it was worn as a scarf. Yes. And if, you, if your body position changed enough, the scarf itself inflated. Mm. Wouldn't so, that strangle you? No. No. It no. inflated upwards and yeah. around. Oh, yeah. Okay. It became like a hoodie. As long as it doesn't direction. inflate inwards at all, you know. Right. Yeah. And so that way you had built-in neck protection and some, some cushioning on your head. Which I'm like, why isn't that more of a thing? Well, some of those jackets do that too yeah. with their collars, and then, of course, right. the thing with the inflatable jacket that I, because you know, a lot of the, a lot of them attach by a lanyard to the bike, so if you become separated, it blows up. And my first thought was, knowing me, I'll forget to unhook that thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I found out that it takes more force than casually dismounting, right. you know, right. to right. set them off. It was still a funny visual image. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can just see me doing that if they were that sensitive. So, John. <laughs> yes. uh, you you're looking at the industry you're you're doing more stunt driving yep what what comes next how do you find your next gig uh, so it's been interesting uh getting into this side of i mean it's already difficult enough getting into stunts as is it's a very niche community i mean very small segment of the union that are actually stunt performers versus actors and background artists and all that kind of stuff um then within stunts getting to stunt driving is a whole nother even smaller one percent of that one percent you know so it's like uh these guys are old school veterans that let's say a lot of times um general i'm generalizing here but a lot of times they've uh these are old timers who have beat up their bodies and uh they can't ground and pound anymore and but or they're just you know they they're more connected or just like they've just been doing it for a lot longer of a time and this is kind of like the reward they can kind of do the you know they can do this like more fun or slash easier or whatever you want to say for this uh, type of particular job, stunt driving. And so that's why these guys are doing it versus where, why newbies or new guys are doing it less, you know, because the older guys, they have more seniority. They have more history. They have more, uh, they like, have more relationships. More relationships. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. More Better networking. Yeah. More networking. Yeah. Is there a ton of turnover in the industry? I've actually only been in the industry for about, um, Three months. So I started doing precision only a month ago. And so I am i can't really answer that question. But I feel like a lot of people, they just get tired of, and they're burnt out from trying to hustle all the time that they just go back to regular nine to five job. Would you say that's true? I, I could see. Yes. Yeah, um, I. So, yeah, I've seen it 
for sure. I've seen a few people. I've seen um, several people drop out. Where you know, it's just like like uh, Kendra's saying. It's it's tough. It's you're. It's not Holly. This is not the same industry that it was like in the '80s, where they could, people could re- survive of their uh, royalty or residual checks anymore. Um, you have to make everything on your front end payments now. And so what's happening is a lot of people need multiple net revenue streams to keep afloat, right? You can't just survive off of like, like let's say even for, for me, for example, sometimes like I won't, I'll go without months without, without working. And, um, you know, so it's just kind of like, you kind of have to have a padded cushion. Sure. Let me ask you both the very personal question that we can edit out later. What would you do if you weren't doing this? Mm-hmm. You can answer first if you want. That's a great question. Um, if I, like, what, if like in terms of if money wasn't involved, in terms of it didn't have to pay money to go racing, or that's yeah, I don't know how to qualify the question. If you weren't doing driving, let's say, God forbid, something terrible happens, sure. or you decide the risks are not are too much for you to take, sure. or whatever, maybe you get sick. Um, what would you do if you didn't drive on a day? I'd then? still probably be doing. Um, I'd still probably be doing film, like, mm-hmm. you know, just probably some other job in terms of like either directing or producing or, you know, something related in the industry. Well, it is harder to get into, though. It's it's not like working in an office. It's literally on every corner. Definitely. Definitely. That's true. But I mean, I guess with my connections and with everything that I know, that's kind of, I feel you like I have a shoe in. Yeah, exactly. Step in versus everyone else. Yeah. Kinder. Um, well, before I got into the industry, I was actually working at a um, pretty big um, automotive corporation that's based here in Atlanta. I won't say the name, but um, they laid me off, and that's how I got into the industry because I thought it was like my kind of like a gateway to try and get into something that I really wanted to pursue, and that was working in film. And then you know, yeah, um, eventually I'll get to his level, stunt driving, maybe in like ten years. <laughs> One thing I should say about the industry as well is uh, there's a lot more jobs involved with it than most people can acknowledge. Because, you know, if you talk film industry, people will think, okay, there's the camera guy, there's the director, there's the actors, there's the stunt people. And that's kind of where they end their list. There's construction, there's logistics, there's accounting, there's location scouts, there's extra work, there's stand-ins, there's all the assistance for the camera, there's all the assistance for what they call the grip team, which sets up flags and shading and lighting there's a whole lighting department there's a special effects department there's a props department like it's it's basically well for anybody who sat around and read the the credits at the end of a movie kind of thing and there are some weird titles out there yeah there's it's basically it's basically an army that runs uh sure yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and it's fantastic it's you really if you want to break away from nine to five and you just kind of want to work really hard several months at a time I encourage people to investigate the the film industry, but like uh, Kinder and John were saying, there's some situations that will leave you with a very sour taste in your mouth, mm. and I've seen a lot of people back out because of those bad relationships and you know bad heads butting each other. Right. Becca, I can't say that while we're recording. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> that was me stifling a very inappropriate comment Becca's to what you said. Self-censoring. <laughs> yeah. So let's tackle a couple of issues on our board, and then we'll do our. Um, our, our, the, the answer to our trivia question. Um, there's something written up here. Ben and I have a Facebook friend, Jenny's ground problem. Jenny has a ground problem in her car, Ben. What was that all about? I think so anyway. Yeah, it's a uh, 2007 Accord, and she had initially reported some problems with, uh, well, with her turn signal. And I, I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, at first it was blinking fast, but it wasn't the bulb. Uh, she tried the signal, the flasher relay, just because it was cheap and easy, and that wasn't it either. And then with the headlight on, it did something different. Uh, hazards worked just fine. So I was thinking there's probably some sort of weird ground issue going on there, and I don't know what she's working on it this weekend, I think, trying to figure out, because you know, we gave her some advice from some things to look for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the things I asked her was, had it been in any collisions or had any body work recently? And she said that the one headlight unit had been replaced. So that's something to look into. The reason I asked about that was because of something that happened with a car I had years ago. I had a 91 Integra that had a front-end collision. Great cars. And oh, it was, I loved that little thing. It was so much fun. Um, and the whole front end had to be rebuilt uh, at great expense. I loved the car that much. I just I handed in my credit card and said, go to work. Uh, it took about a week to do. And a little while after this happened, I was in a thunderstorm one night. I've got the wipers on full. I've got the AC compressor engaged because everything's fogging up so badly. 
I've got lights on and everything, and I start to notice that as the wipers are getting faster, the lights are getting dimmer, and the fan is starting to slow down, like there wasn't enough electrons to go around kind of thing, and I'm fairly good with electrics, but I couldn't find anything wrong. And so I finally, I took it, I think, to the same body shop or something, or I forget where I took it. I said, I'm going to be out of town for a week. You guys have at it and see if you can figure out what's going on. And they called me a few days later and said, well, we had a buddy who's an electrical engineer crawl through your car with a meter for a few days. And he found that when the front end was repaired, a ground wasn't properly restored. So you had basically a, a semiconducting condition going on. You had enough of a ground for most load. But then when you turned everything on, it wasn't enough of a ground. Right. So I wonder if something like that's happening with her. And just for the record, I'm going to read what she wrote. I found her post. She says, my right turn signal is blinking fast and doesn't blink at all when the headlights are on. The hazards are fine, normal speed. She's changed the bulb and the signal relay, but uh, she suspects she's got a bad ground. And so we asked some more questions. She says, it's a 2007 Accord, had a minor accident, and the right headlight was broken. For a little while after that, all the lights still worked. It was only the headlight cover that was broken. She says, I think the fast blinking started after the first time it rained after the headlight was broken. Mm -hmm. She replaced the headlight assembly about two months ago, replaced the turn signal bulb on that side about two weeks ago. A new headlight assembly came with a white turn signal bulb, so she switched it for an amber, and she got a new battery about three months ago. Uh, she says she believed it worked normally for about two days after she replaced the headlight assembly. So Ben had a few things to say, and then I had a few things to say. But well, Becca, what year was the car? Oh, seven. So older, maybe higher mileage. Um, one thing, I'm not going to pick on which car of mine did this, and apparently it happens in the multifunction switch. Uh -huh. um, there can be a short out in the multifunction switch that causes that exact same thing, and since like your hazards are on a button and not off the multifunction switch, they're going a little bit differently it doesn't affect them there's an idea i would think actually somewhere within that switch possibly is the issue that's kind of a gm thing that problem <laughs> i would i, I know I'm you not... weren't trying to call it out but that's, that's a gm <laughs> thing but ronnie, I'm, I'm not... <laughs> ronnie has no problem calling it out <laughs> my, my gm would have to run to have working turn signals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so. <laughs> it could still be a switch thing, though. It, it could still be. be a switch it could thing. be. Um, I, I did have this one Honda once that the headlight switch, you know, one of those ones little knob on the end of the turn signal stock that you turn and turn the headlights mm -hmm. on. When, mm -hmm. After the lights had been on for a few minutes, that knob on the end would get hot. Yeah. So yeah. anybody's switch can develop Malfunction. a problem. Yeah. 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 So Mike's suggestion was her to us to take off the, the, the lens and to look at every single wiring harness back there. But it's plug and play. If she's only changing the lens and the bulbs, it's plug and play. So when I had a Volvo. Oh, God, the, I'm sorry. The contacts, <laughs> it was a great car. The, it was expensive to maintain, but, um, but the, the contacts on a Volvo bulb had over time gotten soft and shorted, and that caused a similar problem to what she's describing. So my Contacts in the, in the socket? On the actual bulb itself. Okay. Like there, there, there were there was you know two points of contact on the bottom the the, the bottom of the bulb, mm -hmm. and softer material kind of like lead, which I'm assuming it's partially lead. So those two had gotten soft and merged, and there was the short. I mm -hmm. would say go right, and the whole thing would turn on and then not turn off again because of the short. Mm -hmm. So um, in her case, if she had a problem where water got into a harness somewhere, or so she's changing them in the rain. Sorry. Maybe. Who knows? I mean, you know, just check out all the contact points was my first suggestion. Right. And plus, when you so. install things like light bulbs, even though it almost seems overkill, still use dielectric grease. Sure. It can help. Yeah. And then Ben said which the, that she might have a ground, right? So Well, possibly. A ground issue. I, you, I told her, look for any, you know, black or brown wires with a loop terminal on them that might be hanging loose. For all we know, there could have been one on one of the fasteners for that headlight assembly. Right. Uh, uh, also, take apart the bulb socket to look inside of it to oh, make yeah. sure no corrosion has happened. Uh, look on the back side where the wiring harness actually plugs into the socket. Yep. But the hazard no... lights are still working. It's Yeah, it, it can share enough of a ground for mm -hmm. the hazards to work. It's it would ha it's what happened on my 240. There's just need a little bit of gangrene on the contacts that doesn't allow enough voltage to flow on the individual circuit. But when you have the hazards, it shares enough of the load I that it will still flash saying. at okay. the normal rate. Uh, so it's probably something as simple as that, uh, especially if the headlight was cracked and rain got in. Rain is what will cause that kind of corrosion to happen right. sooner than later. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So shall we give the trivia answer? Yes. Grand trivia auto. The question was, 
Premier Automotive Group was formed in the early 2000s primarily to handle Ford's acquisition of European brands such as Aston Martin, Land Rover, Jaguar, and Volvo. Which two American brands were also rolled into this umbrella? Was it Pontiac and Oldsmobile, Lincoln and Hummer, Mercury and Lincoln, or Mercury and Plymouth? Any guesses? Ken, Mercury. start us off. Um, Mercury and Lincoln. Mercury and Lincoln. Any reasons why you're picking that? Oh, I've just always associated them together for some reason. Our other guest, John? I have to say I, have, I agree with that because I'm, I'm assuming that why would Ford be able to pocket package off GM's products or anything like that, right? right. So I'm assuming it's right. going to be their own stuff. Becca? I, I was thinking the same thing, that, that it was going to be the or yeah. other Ford labels, yeah. Yeah, because the others were spoken for by other companies. <laughs> so. Yeah, and it kind of confused. I thought Mercury and Lincoln was already under Ford's umbrella. I guess that's why the the, the question's confusing me a bit. It, 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 the yeah. question makes it sound like it's a new acquisition. Right. Um, it's, it's a question that is meant well, to trip you up. It's, yeah. I think yeah. it's packaging... Yeah. What's the word I'm going for? Internal, Sub labels, uh, by... yeah, an internal corporate structure thing, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the answer is, in fact, Mercury and Lincoln. It says as a last ditch effort to save the Mercury brand, Ford mm -hmm. reorganized Mercury and Lincoln under Premier Automotive Group. Yeah, so gotcha. everybody and Lincoln in was kind of suffering for a while. They've they've had a resurgence, but yes. Um, no, this question is but merely this, meant to yeah. take advantage yeah. of and people who aren't paying attention. This question is also old because uh, Mercury got the axe after the with mm -hmm. the financial crisis in '08, and um, all those like that. This is back when Ford actually owned yes. Aston Martin and everything, and that yeah. all split up and everything like that. Oh right? yeah, they're yeah. all right. Yeah. It's a data. It's an old yeah. data question for sure. Ford lost so. uh, Jaguar. They lost Aston Martin. Mm -hmm. and well, they sold them others. off. Um, yeah. They were not in the position like the other two. Mm -hmm. American automakers, they they were still doing well, mm -hmm. but I think a lot of that was to maintain doing well. Mm. Right. Pretty much, yeah. Kinder, or to not be hurting as bad. <laughs> Kinder, John, thank you for joining us again. I, I hope we can do this again sometime. Yes, thank you thank so you. much. Before we sign off, oh. though, uh, John, where do we find you? You're a public figure of sorts. How, uh, how, do, the, how do the good people that <laughs> listen to us follow you? Sure. Uh, you can follow me on my Instagram at shimjohnj. That's S-H-I-M as in Mary, J-O-H-N-J. Cool. And Kinder, how do we? How do the good people find you to support your career and uh, follow you as you continue to grow up the ranks? Um, my Instagram is Kinderu, K Y N D R O O. Kinderu. Kinderu. And right. John Shim J. Shim John J. Shim Shim Shim. <laughs> Shimmy Shim. <laughs> what, yeah. what he said. <laughs> yeah. Right. Thanks, you guys. This has been fun. Thank you, guys. Um, Thank you so much. And thanks to our listeners, as always, for joining us. We really appreciate your comments and feedback. We hope you enjoyed this particular episode. Uh, and if you did, please let us know via our website, thethinkaboutcars.com. And if you didn't, please let us know via our Facebook page. Uh, you can find us on Facebook at The Thing About Cars. We should probably do something with Instagram at some point. In any case. Didn't we try to? We've tried, but we, you know, we're old. So <laughs> <laughs> You're never too old for Instagram. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Be safe out there. We'll see you in about a week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. All right, so this is how you win the Seal Skin Cover, courtesy of the Seal Skin Covers Company. Go to The Thing About Cars website. That's thethingaboutcars.com. There you should find a link to a blog post entitled, We're Giving Away a Seal Skin Cover. There you'll find a link to a form which you can use to enter. It doesn't matter what you drive or where you live. All you have to do is give us a name and a valid email address via that form. And while you're at it, we always appreciate your feedback about the show. One lucky listener will be selected at random to win their very own Seal Skin Cover, courtesy of Warren Jobs and the Seal Skin Covers Company. Thanks, as always, for being a part of the Thing About Cars family. We'll see you soon. Thank you for listening. This has been The Thing About Cars. We'll see you on the road.